I'm Alex. I'm here to introduce someone who might just have the most straight out of science fiction idea of everyone we hear speak. So if you follow electronics, you know that our current battery technology is quite unsexy. Um, lithium batteries improve at snail speed. They hold back all our electronic devices. They're toxic. They're polluting. So what if I told you that someone is making printable, stable, tiny, and flexible batteries, like paper thin, bending around your wrist, future technology? Well, our speaker today is. She's a revolutionary in the field of batteries. She's a Berkeley PhD, 50 smartest companies beating out Uber, by the way. <laughs> and interviewing her today is a legend himself, 75 internet patents, founding director and chief scientist of Sutarja Dai. If you're at Berkeley and it says entrepreneurship on it, he probably had his hand in it. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christine Ho and Dr. Iklok Sidhu. Hey. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Uh, all right. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. I think I'm the, um, uh, I'm the one to hand it off to, probably. Um, and let's see, where, where to start? So um, let's see. I think you, um, so Christine, I, I've definitely known you. Let's see, are, are, okay, I'm looking at the screens are changing and things like that. All right. So I was going to say, um, uh, I, I've definitely known you for a while. You've had this amazing journey. Um, I'm trying, to, I was trying to count back how many years um, have I like been aware of what you're doing or been talking to you about these things or, you know, something like that. Um, I'm not even sure I know the number. I, I, I think it's over 10. Um, it's over 10. It's over 10. So mm -hmm. I'm, so I thought, well, how will we have this conversation? And maybe what I'll do is I'll just pretend I don't remember any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get me out, out of a lot of trouble to start with. And then um, for, for things I may not remember. And then, so I'll just ask you the questions um, and, or maybe the other way around. You can start, and if I remember another detail, maybe I can add it in. But um, let's start with um, how did we meet? Maybe what were you doing, and how how did we meet? Um, yeah. So how how did we meet? I was a PhD student in material science at Berkeley. Um, I was researching printable zinc batteries at the time, um, and. In particular, what I remember is I had uh, near near the end of my PhD, um, I had some really interesting results and through um, some classes and through my advisors got introduced to um, the broader industry. So companies that were interested in our technology, uh, venture capitalists that were kind of investing in the space. Um, so I started to talk to the outside world about how to get this technology um, commercialized. And it was the first time I really thought like, oh, maybe there is a pathway for these batteries, you know, beyond Berkeley. Um, but I had a really, really difficult meeting with a venture capitalist. Um, he asked me if we had filed any patents for uh, this technology. And I was like, what is a patent? <laughs> and, um, and then he looked at me and said, what? You know, like, you don't even know about patents, like, you know, Berkeley isn't teaching these grad students how to protect IP, you know, this is basically technology flushed down the drain. And I, I felt really deflated after this meeting. And I remember um, uh, going and, and asking to meet with you, Iklok, and just wanting to vent, <laughs> just like, you know, wanting to sort of vent about the fact that, you know, this, uh, you know, did I miss something in my, my time as a grad student? You know, how could this be? Is there a pathway to commercializing this technology, even though this venture capitalist was very disparaging? Um, and I remember at that meeting, you listened, um, and then we had a really just simple idea, like, uh, let's, let's actually learn more about IP strategy for um, commercialization of technologies that come out of Berkeley. And let's, let's talk to other people that have done it. Um, and let's just chronicle that. Let's write a report and let's share that so that other students and other academics on campus can learn from that and um, and you know benefit from that. So that that was I, I, our first real I think um, you know kind of one on one meeting where we we sort of brainstormed together something to do. And I remember spending a summer with you, um, getting introduced to various entrepreneurs, investors, lawyers, all you know academics, professors. Um, you know, interviewed over 30, 40 different people, just asking about IP strategy and learning about how 
new technologies actually um, spin out of university. So it was it was a really fun summer um, collaborating with you in that way. All right, thank you. So um, I'm so glad that you had that answer because it sounds a lot like the way I remember it too. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> We're on the same page. The same I remember that. Um, I had this uh, office in Sitarja Dai Hall on the fourth floor and yeah. you had an office somewhere in, in that area. And I don't remember exactly what year this would be. What, I don't know. Is it 2006, seven, eight? I, 2007 ish. I think. Yeah. Around, around 2007. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the center um, at that time, the center was not called the Sitarja Center. It was yeah. the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And we had mm -hmm. just gotten it started. And we had like two classes that we were teaching at that time. You know, it was something yeah. like that. And, um, and I think up until that moment, uh, you know, I knew that, um, that this whole IP topic was kind of a big mess. Like at every yeah. university, it, it, it was a mess. And, yeah. um, and so we, we basically chose all of our curriculum, what we would teach. And we're like, yeah, IP, no, let's just leave that out. Because uh, yeah. we know what, how, it's how too much. hard, too hard. Can't, yeah. Right. Like too many other like things to deal with. So, um, so I was basically trying to stay away from that if I could possibly do it. And then you came over and you're like, yeah, I got this one problem. It's like the one thing that I was trying to like, not really get involved with I'm like mm -hmm. okay but now that you're here <laughs> and this is exactly the one problem like okay fine so I so that was um that that was all right and that, that's the way I remember um and I and so like yes I remember you know and of course like I don't have to remember that hard but like you know I, I remember all all of those things and I I know that you um you know in parallel uh, would refer to the idea of starting the company as living yeah. the dream. Do, do, you, do you remember <laughs> using that terminology? It's still on my LinkedIn profile. I think <laughs> I, haven't up, I haven't updated my profile since I started Imprint Energy. And I think it, it still says I'm living and building my dreams. And it's, it's still true. You know, okay. it's been 11 years since I spun out the company. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Very the case. Yeah, because, you know, I think the idea was that, well, yeah, you know, I've got this research going on. If like I can always go to work for some someone and I can always like have yeah. my cube and, you know, work on my experiments or do, you know, like I'm qualified to do all of that. But if I can somehow live that dream, right, I think mm -hmm. I think you were pursuing that. Um, I think you're saying that that like that was a central motivation or, you know, all, all those types of things. Actually, tell me about um, yeah. your research a bit. Um, yeah. Let, let's start there because. Some yeah. People, and let me finish the question. So tell me about your research and tell me where you saw like, oh, this is an opportunity. And how did mm -hmm. like, you know, let's say there's 100 PhD students in like like, you know, one building or something like which one of them should think like, no, this really is an opportunity. And, you know, no, you know, like, like you've got like great work you can do, but it's not really going to start a company. Um, right. Tell me how you saw it, like what you're doing, how you saw yeah. that this could do that. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, so I, I went to Berkeley for all of my degrees. So I was at Berkeley from undergrad all the way to grad school. Um, and my sophomore year as an undergrad, I uh, was just lucky enough to join a group doing battery research. Um, so that, that was, you know, the first step in, in this direction in, in energy storage in general. And um, when I first started, I was researching traditional lithium batteries. I got formal training on, you know, just how lithium chemistry works and learning how to build very conventional, you know, industrial grade lithium batteries. Um, but when I became a grad student, uh, my my group actually was given um, a project through the California Energy Commission to enable what is now considered the Internet of Things. Um, it wasn't called that back then. It was called something that you can't even remember, like peer-to-peer peer -peer or, or machine-to-machine wireless sensor networks. Um, and the idea was that um, 
there's so many um, valuable insights that can be taken from things if you can track and understand what happened to them. Um, there's so much waste, for example, in the food industry and in the pharma industry when you're just literally moving stuff around through log through logistic supply chain. Um, there's so much to be had if you could track your own well-being, your health metrics. You could learn from that data and actually, you know, prescribe um, good treatments for yourself or, or healthy living. So uh, there was just this sort of broad premise that. Um, we want to be able to track more. And as a result, we need to put electronics on more things. Um, but a key sort of uh, technology block for that would be to make batteries that could kind of blend into our lives. Um, and so that kind of put me on a path to looking at batteries differently, you know, thinking about batteries, not like in cylinder or brick format, but, you know, maybe something that's thin, flexible, that could kind of, um, you know, blend in, in your body or on a, on a label of some sort. Um, and I think at the time I was really enamored with uh, the 3D printing industry, this idea of, democratizing manufacturing such that you make things as you need them, where you need them, um, you know, highly localized sort of manufacturing. And uh, so that kind of married with the idea of, of thinking about chemistries that are much more inherently safe, green, sustainable. Um, so zinc as a chemistry started to really kind of, um, kind of float to the top as like a, a candidate there. So, um, you know, we, we took a, we took a turn, a detour, instead of looking at conventional lithium batteries, like everybody else, we started to look at something really different, these printable zinc batteries. Um, and for a long time, it was just really hardcore material science, you know, just finding new materials that could enable essentially a solid state zinc battery, new materials that would be uh, compatible with printing. Um, but what sort what's happened was we we just got really interesting results. I was really lucky. You know, you spend a lot of time making very bad batteries that don't work or, you know, kind of wasting time with a lot of different chemistries, but you learn along the way. And then um, we started to get some really interesting results that were also pretty reproducible, um, you know, batteries that were working that had kind of remarkable performance. And when I started to publish that, I started to get a lot of interest from the outside world, like companies kind of seeing the, seeing, um, you know, my talks or seeing um, papers that we wrote and then actually kind of like knocking on our door and saying like, we want to learn more and how do we get our hands on this technology? So, you know, that, that was at the end of my PhD when there's just sort of a seed um, in my mind, like, oh, like there might be a pathway for all this research that I'd spent, you know, almost 10 years dedicated to there might be a pathway to this actually, you know, getting into the real world and solving real problems. So that, that ended up becoming the seed for Imprint. Uh, but yeah, that, that was essentially kind of the research angle that, you know, essentially launched Imprint Energy. So in, in a way, there's kind of like two pivots from standard research in the direction. The first is, and I, I remember at this time period, like you use the term IOT, but I know mm -hmm. there was other projects going on at Berkeley, like tiny yeah. OS and things like that. So mm -hmm. everybody was thinking about, oh, how do, how does everything become small? So yeah. first you had this, okay, we're going to have small things. And, you know, and, and so if somebody's working on the OS, your group yeah. would work on the battery. And then yeah. somehow you took the, the next pivot, which was, but let's look at the green version. There, there was like no, yeah. like, you know, absolute need to look at a green version, but somehow yeah. you started to, and then that got you to zinc. And then somehow you had a surprising or serendipitous like result that I guess the energy, energy density was enough or something like yeah. that. And yeah. surprised everyone that this chemistry could be both like somehow that, like, I guess it was still like many things you could do with it, but all this was somehow coming right. together. Yeah. Um um, so on the, on the first point, uh, there were all these sort of technology trends that, um, that, that academics were really focused on, like you said, like making things more miniature, smaller, um, they're trying to make uh, different components less power hungry, so that you could kind of marry um, all these different components with a battery that's compact, but still, still suitable to, to power all these um, different kind of, um, you know, sensors and wireless radios for communication. So there's a, a big effort there. Um, and so uh, why IoT exists today is all those different technology trends have sort of merged in the middle and, and created, um, you know, essentially products that um, are actually feasible to make and, and low power enough and miniature enough. Um, so, yeah, those trends are all kind of swirling or happening at the same time. Um, 
sort of on the on the second point in terms of the focus on greenness you know part of that i think is just being at berkeley there's just uh, you know there's just i think more of an environmental focus um but actually you know i had spent a lot of time working with battery technology uh, lithium battery technologies and um lithium chemistry is just really annoying to, <laughs> to handle it's a it's a reactive material you need to have glove boxes because trace moisture can cause very terrible reactions. You know, if you've heard of lithium explosions, um, the materials are just really yeah. difficult to even, even to acquire. So I was just kind of sick of it. I was maybe kind of lazy and I was thinking like, I can work on a chemistry that is just easier to handle, easier to acquire the materials. Um, the zinc is so earth abundant. It's almost like dirt and, um, and it's proven to be energy dense. There's no reason why this can't compete from a performance standpoint. It just, we just need to find a solid state version that is has enough performance to, to, you know, uh, be considered for these solid state applications. Um, so that, that was, you know, it wasn't just for the sort of the altruism of being green. It was a little bit also to kind of simplify the manufacturing. Um, and that's kind of actually come full circle for us like now today at Imprint. It turns out that's that green sort of profile, the sustainability, we just did a life cycle analysis is actually really important um, because a lot of these electronics will go into our lives and then um what happens to them at the end of life of that device people worry about disposal and recycling so they do want that kind of full circle sustainable uh opportunity and our, our technology can actually do that so it's actually kind of paid dividends that we hadn't even really thought of at the time but you know early on i was just really kind of sick and tired of dealing with the really hard to work chemistry you know one thing so um first of all i'll just validate your your um uh, major was material science right yeah, that's All right. Yeah, okay. So, um, but let me keep going with this kind of where where I'm I'm going with this part of the questions mm -hmm. is I'm wondering if you had what I would call like an entrepreneurial like perspective to research even and uh, yeah. like so th this is like a brand new conversation like not we ever talked about it or anything but yeah um, once I attended like I don't remember the fellow's name but I think he got like either a Nobel Prize or a Millennium Prize or something like he's mm -hmm. a, um, a like a physicist or solid state physicist in Japan but why he got the prize was because he developed the blue LED uh, and mm -hmm. you probably know who I'm talking about, like, because mm -hmm. it's like closer to your area that, than mine. But mm -hmm. I actually saw him speak live. And like, it was like, completely random. It's not like I would, it's like the only talk I ever saw on like a solid you know, last <laughs> 15 years or whatever, uh, you know, on, on something about solid state. But it happened yeah. to be this guy who like, like a year later then gets this Nobel Prize or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I was in the talk and he said, everyone was trying to find the blue, you know, the, the secret to a blue LED because it was only one step away from that to a white one. And if you can get that, then you can get this like, you know, industrial lighting and, and so forth. Right. So, and he's, and he says there were basically like 300 researchers that were all like after this thing. And he describes this super complicated process of like 26 layers or something like that yeah. of different kinds of silicon that you stack up to, to be able to, to get it. And yeah. he said, so everybody was looking down like this path and this path. And I thought, this is just his quote. He's like, and I just thought, well, since everybody's looking at that, whether they're right or wrong, I, I'm just not going to look in that direction because they're yeah. going to find it before me. So yeah. I'm just going to look in some other like direction. And yeah. so that was like, uh, and I'm just, okay. And so like, if I take this to the parallel of entrepreneurship, it's like, if there's some like crowded market, you know, it's yeah. like, you know, some people are like, oh, there's so much activity there. Let me go into that space. And other yeah. people will say, well, you know what? There's so much activity there. Let me go play in like a completely different area. Um, yeah. So like my question is, were any of those thoughts kind of in your head as you're doing the research about getting yeah. out of where everyone else was looking? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, that that reminds me of um, my time in Japan. Um, so in between my master's and PhD, I got three months to research in Japan, just do a completely independent project. Um, and I was, I was brought over there as like a lithium battery expert, I guess. And then I was supposed to work with a printing group there to print 3d lithium batteries. Um, and I was, 
uh, I was uh, introduced this, to this really big group. Um, it was like a, a, a research group of like 300 individuals. The idea, they were all focused on lithium battery research. And the idea was every single one of those 300 researchers had like a tiny little facet that they would hammer on. And if one person hit gold, the entire team would like, you know, then kind of <laughs> pile on that. And that's, that's how they did research. It was all like a team effort, you know, and, and, you know, everybody kind of just, um, you know, waited for that kind of winning moment. And I remember, you know, I, I remember going to that group and thinking like, I, I just, I don't operate like that. I just don't want to be kind of one of 300. Um, and so, you know, I think in my time there, it also kind of encouraged me to really take a different path. You know, I, I moved, it was actually in Japan that I decided to go from lithium to zinc um, for a lot of different reasons. That was kind of one of them. Um, it's just this idea like, you know, I don't, I don't need a, I don't need a hammer, you know, along with all the other people so that are sort of in this crowded space. And there might be, you know, real gold nuggets if I go in this different direction. And I think in the battery industry too, there's a lot of like, um, there's just a lot of like sort of like embedded like you've got to do things a certain way you know the batteries that are in the tesla today are still the same ones and the same chemistry that was in a, a laptop maybe 30 40 years ago the first sony yeah. laptops or whatnot and right. so there's a really slow movement of just like accepting new things and so i just felt like it was worth having a little bit of courage to do something different and just showing that there is a possible successful path so that was always kind of in the back of my mind especially having that experience in japan just you know kind of wanting to to step in a different direction and, and just see, you know, just take a chance and see what happens. And and how long were you, like, at some point you had this like motivation that whatever work you're doing, it's going to go towards a, a type of battery that doesn't exist today. Like it, it yep. was going to go towards this like flexible, wearable, uh, you know, light, you know, mm -hmm. like green, wh whichever version, but you're like, so like, I think if it is, you chose a hard problem and then you were after it for a while, but clearly it wasn't just one year. Like how long um, a period of time, you know, did you like between the time that you chose the problem and yeah. I mean, like to, to some degree, you're still working on that problem, but yeah. Yeah. So it's sure. hard to say like where, like, uh, yeah, let's at least say until the yeah. start of the company, how, how long were you kind of focused on yeah. that? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, first off, I, I got formal training as an undergrad from 2002 to 2005. And so I was doing lithium battery research, like making coin cells, um, like, you know, cylindrical cells, pouch cells, that kind of thing. Um, so just hardcore sort of training up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and in, in different Berkeley labs. Um, but then from 2005 to 2007, I started to think a lot about printing things. Um, so that's really kind of introduced me to manufacturing things differently rather than conventional battery manufacturing. I started looking a lot at 3D printing and just doing doing kind of different manufacturing methods. Um, and then 2007 is that time I went to Japan. So that's when we I made that kind of switch from lithium to zinc. So 2007 to 2010 is when I really focused everything kind of honed in um, to that kind of printable zinc battery for these IoT devices. So really, it was three hardcore years of just experimentation, materials, you know, kind of exploration, and then. Um, and then, and then actually at the end, kind of telling that story out loud to, to industry and, 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 you know, getting feedback from industry that that might be interesting. So about three really kind of hardcore years on, on this specific uh, project. Okay. All right. So, and one reason why I'm bringing this up is I'm, I think I'm trying to reinforce a point, which I think is true, or I believe, which is that, you know, every time you see some kind of like amazing entrepreneurial venture or some like, you know, someone has like, uh, like created some invention that everyone uses. Everyone thinks that like, oh, they just kind of like stepped in the shower one day and like, oh, right. it. And that Not like, <laughs> you know, in those five minutes, they're like, oh, I put it together. This is the mm -hmm. secret. But, you know, there's a book called uh, um, something, I'm trying to remember, like uh, how, to, how to get a good idea. I, I, I don't even remember now, but it, it, where good ideas come from. And mm -hmm. um and, you know, one of the points they make in that book is that you only n see those things at the very end and you don't know about the three years and the five years and the seven years that yeah. were like behind it where someone was just like persistently after like doing yeah. something, some certain thing. And they had like all these versions that didn't work. And then finally it clicked. And then yeah. 
you know, and then you're like, oh, well, it just clicked because, you know, like they were just lucky because it clicked. Yeah. But it was really like all that buildup. So d- I, I guess I'm trying to get your your validation here. Um, yeah. Do you, do you say, yeah, it really works like that? Or you're like, no, not really. I just kind of like serendipity. <laughs> it just happened. No, I, I mean, I, I've, I spent a lot of days doing really bad experiments, you know, working on things that just didn't work at all. Um, you know, I think being a PhD student can be really tough. You have to self-regulate in terms of just keeping yourself motivated when so many things can go wrong. You're, you're, you know, not only does your experiment not work, but the tool stops working or you don't get time on a machine when yeah. you think you will. Yeah. Um, and so um, there was a lot of frustration along the way. There was a lot of like, man, I, I might be working on something that'll never come to, to come to light. And um, and you, you've got to figure out a way to kind of cope and, and manage yourself through that, that marathon. And it can be really hard. I, you know, I, I know a lot of other students, um, we kind of leaned on each other because <laughs> we were we were just sort of sick of doing really bad experiments that weren't you know turning out the way we did. We we thought we were smart enough you know every day, um, but every day was just sort of like a new experiment, <laughs> you know, potentially gone wrong. So you know when when things started to work, actually it was really funny because almost every Christmas my advisor Jim Evans would say, "All I want for Christmas is a working battery," <laughs> and he said that since I was an undergrad. <laughs> so you know, so he he'd been saying that for a while, um, and so for a long time we we couldn't get things to work. I had. I would like make batteries. I, I'd like cross section them. I take pictures and they're like holes and they just, they look like Swiss cheese. Um, but yeah, when, you know, when at the, at sort of at the end, um, we kind of put some things together and then, yeah, like the results were kind of surprising. We're like, hmm, that's interesting. But even, even the validation of that, like getting that to be repeatable and reliable to the point where you could actually take enough data to write a paper and to show companies also took time. It took, you know, months, even after we had an inkling that we were on the right path. So oh. um, it takes, it takes a lot of hard work. So in, in a minute, we'll switch to what happened, you know, after you graduated and kind mm-hmm. of where it's gone, but I have kind of one more of these like formation kind of questions, which is um, how er- like some researchers they they're basically like they keep all their results like super quiet and secret for like you mm-hmm. know not they don't try to keep it secret but they're just working on it somewhat independently for a long time yeah. and then you know at the end they're like okay so this is what we got and yeah. hopefully it's a match other people have a like a model where it's like you try to show people what you've got as early as possible to keep yeah. all these connections and stay in the conversation. What was the model um, that you used and the model that was in your research group? And did that work yeah. or not work to your advantage? What what happened there? Yeah, my, my group happened to be really um, uh, connected to industry. We had very regular um, industry workshops where co- people from different companies would come in and they, they would encourage all the students to either present a poster or pre- present, you know, actual presentations of our work. Um, so I think our, our group had the model that we should, you know, uh, speak out, you know, early on and get feedback throughout the process. You know, I, I had, I remember one person, um, I think he was from Qualcomm, he would come to me almost on a yearly basis and say, um, how do you make this 10x better? Um, 10x cheaper and uh, and he cared about green and sustainability. He was like an, and 10x you know more sustainable. And he would ask me that every year, you know, and I would have you know not so great answers for many years. And then you know got to got to the point where I could actually respond to him with something compelling. So um, so my my group happened to be much more open. I, I tend to also be a much more collaborative person. You know, I just I like to communicate to people ideas and 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 co create together. Um, so I definitely took the approach of of of, of being a lot more. Collaborative. I do. I do know that when you are a PhD, though, um, there is a little bit of fear that you know if you haven't figured it out, you you feel a little sort of embarrassed to sometimes talk about your your work and your results. And I know that can be kind of a hindrance to reaching out and speaking out. So you know, I I, I dealt with some self confidence at times, like not really wanting to reveal that you know maybe I didn't have everything all figured out or whatnot, and, and some embarrassment around that. But um, my group, I think my my professors in particular really pushed us to, you know, be out there, you know, to really kind of speak our ideas, even if they were work in progress. So I think that that motivated me. I was, I was really shy, actually. I just, I didn't 
I didn't like to publicly speak. I was, you know, just didn't put my words together in a, in an articulate way. And so, um, so that, that helped, you know, it just encouraged us to converse, um, you know, with, with industry as often as possible. And I think that helped, um, with the quality of my work and also like the focus um, that made it much more applied and, and maybe useful to the real world. Okay, fantastic. So if I reiterate kind of your like two things that came out of that response, one is, um, and I, you know, and I definitely think this does work is the earlier and the more open you are, the more that the more you engage what I would call the ecosystem, the earlier that you engage it, the more likely that whatever your work does gets out. But then you you actually threw in another thing. I didn't ask it, but um, mm-hmm. but I'm glad you said it. And that was you know, this kind of personal transformation, you, you mm-hmm. characterize yourself as more shy and kind of holding back. And I, you know, I'm going to assume that you overcame that, or, you know, yeah. Over time. yeah. So, I had, a, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, I gave a talk once in the middle of my, my PhD. I wasn't, I wasn't close to graduating yet. I gave a talk and um, somebody came up to me and he was like, that's the worst talk I've ever get or I've ever seen. You were the worst speaker I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just, he just sort of walked away and I was just like, man. <laughs> I, I, it's like a rough world out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, but um, you know, I just kind of took that as, like in stride. I was like, well, I'm going to have to probably give another one of these in a month and, you know, just get another chance to, to, to practice and get better. So, you know, the, the I, reason, I, there was a transformation for sure. Yeah. The, the reason I bring it up, I just wanted to slide it in there is that, that you know people really do grow you know it, yeah. it's like if you're not like that type now it doesn't mean that you're not you know through the things that you choose to do it it doesn't mean that you're always going to be like that and i know so yeah. many you know other entrepreneurs they say if you walk by me in high school you wouldn't even notice me or you know something like that and then yeah. you know, they do very well and they're you know command a lot of attention and power and you know all Absolutely. these things you know, later on in lives so it's it's yeah. really not like like nobody changes it's it's really you know yeah many people change a lot. Okay, let, let's switch to what happened after. So what's the, you know, what's the story that the, you know, the company story, what happened in that next, you know, 10 years or whatever? Yeah, um, well, so first off, I, I got a chance to join um, a, a Haas business school class called Clean Tech to Market. And the idea was that, that um, they, in, they asked inventors like me to um, uh, lend our projects to a group of students and the students would spend a semester developing go-to-market strategies. Um, and I happened to fi- uh, meet my co-founder that way. Um, and also it, it just codified that there was a potential pathway to commercialization and that it, it, it was doable. Um, and there was legitimate industry uh, industry interest. There was legitimate interest from investors and, and various sorts. And so, um, so that definitely created a seed that, you know, um, an imprint energy spin out could be possible. Um, you know, uh, I, I personally also am, am just not a lone wolf. I, I don't like to work just by myself or whatnot. And so meeting my co-founder and just kind of finding that sort of synergy, like, hey, there's somebody else here that I work well with and that also believes in this vision, I think um, help kind of cement that sort of emotional um, just courage to, to take a leap and, and to, to start the company. So, um, so shortly after graduating and taking this class, um, you know, essentially me and my co-founder decided to start this company and go for it. And one of the first things we did was actually enter a business competition in the, the center for entrepreneurship and technology. One of, um, yeah, you, you were, you were actually MC for this, this business competition. Um, and so we just, we just said like, Hey, we're going to try and, you know, either we're going to get validation or <laughs> we're not going to win. And we actually ended up uh, being one of the winners and getting, you know, I think a $7,500 check from your center, um, and getting a little bit of space. So, it just sort of, it gave, it kind of gave us a little bit of that um, emotional validation that like, Hey, this is, you know, worth, worth pursuing. And, and then we just kept, you know, applying to new competitions, um, applying to grants and just kind of building momentum from there. And uh, yeah, so that, that was really kind of the, the start of imprint. It was really at, in the hub at, at Berkeley, you know, through the entrepreneurial, um, you know, classes and programs that were available on campus. When, when you started, you started off as CTO, right? Because yeah. as you worked with your partner, your partner was the CTO. 
uh, with, with the CEO. And you kind of, I'm assuming you selected that arrangement because they were a business student and you were an engineering student. So it would work that way. Do you think yeah. that you should have or could have been CEO from the beginning? Or do you think that that transition was kind of the like necessary one to get to yeah. like the point that you're at? Yeah. Um, well, so so actually, I, I was CTO, um, but my business partner did not feel comfortable actually being CEO. So we actually spent a year um, just sort of uh, recruiting a more um, more experienced CEO. Um, and we actually found somebody who had been at like five other batteries or not battery startups, but just startups in general. And he was, you know, really well versed in the space, did a lot in early stage stuff. And so uh, we found somebody who we felt comfortable running the company. Um, and he joined us a year later. And, and so for about five years, he was CEO of the company. Um, for me, you know, thinking back on that, that was definitely the right thing. I was, um, you know, not at all confident, you know, even in the CTO role, let alone uh, being a CEO. And I, I learned a lot, you know, working alongside um, that early CEO. You know, I, there are things that I learned about, you know, deal making, um, setting up joint development agreements, grants, um, you know, you know, just kind of business etiquette just by watching him and, and being in meetings and being on calls where I wasn't the one that was kind of having to take the heat. So um, at the time, it was really honestly the right decision for all people involved. And um, we were able to really kind of uh, launch and grow uh, with that experience. So I, you know, I, I, I take those five years as, as um, really kind of really great years, because I also had to become a technology manager and leader, which, you know, at, at Berkeley, I was, I was on my own, I was a PhD student. So I, I had a lot of learning to do, even just in, in being, um, in, in growing, growing my leadership style. And, and so, you know, on, from a number of fronts, both doing as well as kind of absorbing, uh, it was, it was a really good sort of learning experience to me. So I wouldn't have changed that, you know, um, when I became CEO, uh, five years later, um, I, it wasn't actually a choice. My, my CEO uh, actually decided to leave the company in surprise. And, and I, you know, I, I remember when he told me, I was like, what, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, I just, I, I didn't see myself. I didn't envision myself in the CEO role. And my, I went to my board and I told them exactly that. I was like, I don't, I don't see myself, you know, running this company. And actually they encouraged me to consider that and, and, um, and, you know, essentially kind of mentored me through that transition. So, um, so even, even to this day, I, I, I feel I struggle sort of, you know, kind of embodying this role a little bit. And, and that's just maybe because I, I hadn't really kind of envisioned myself in it, but um, you have know, spent a lot of time, you know, kind of cultivating my, my skills here and also my comfort level and, in, 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 you know, leading in this direction. So I definitely appreciate having the time to, to learn from somebody else um, who, yeah, who I, was more experienced. I, I, so I, I think you've got a, a great message in terms of like the, like the comfort and being able to, to learn from other people, and at this, it, like, I mean, I think it really does work. You know, if you work at a company with good management, you learn good management skills. If you exactly. work at a company with bad management, you know, you don't get that benefit. <laughs> you probably take those bad skills to other places. So basically yeah. don't do that. But, but, you know, so there's a learning journey there. Um, but then on the other hand, you are the mission driven leader. So yeah. whether or not you had the finesse or the like what you're supposed to do in that job you did have the 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 like driven target of where you're trying to take everybody and so you know uh, and i know a lot of venture capital firms today and it wasn't the case in the past but t today kind of believe in mission driven leaders so it's like yeah. okay we'll like help you get there but you know we'll bet on you because you're choosing the mission yeah yeah, I, you know, it's, it's funny, because, you know, about, yeah, a little more than five, maybe six years ago, um, yeah, I was, I was asked by my board to, to become CEO. And, um, and, you know, and they, they heard that message that I, I didn't feel like I could do it, or I was ready. Um, I just got an email from one of my investors um, on my board, my one of my board members, like a, a couple months ago, and he just sent me this really nice email. He, and he was like, you know, you just ran a board meeting and I felt like you were really a CEO. You, you, you made yeah. some really, you know, decisive decisions and I had been waiting for this moment and I, I knew you could do this. I know, I know it's taken a while and I know you didn't necessarily want to be in this position, but I see it, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, I, I have really supportive, you know, board members, investors that, you know, f were willing to kind of cultivate and, and grow along, along, grow with me and, uh, and also kind of motivate that. So I, I feel really appreciative of that, having that experience and having that opportunity. 
One, yeah, uh, awesome. Um, it, it's it, it's definitely embodies that idea of learning, kind of all the way, you know, all, all the way through. Um, yeah, and definitely congratulations to you for you know, all of the accomplishment. Um, let me, um, I, I think I got really just like two questions left. Mm-hmm. Um, they can be short or long if that's up to you. Um, mm-hmm. I think one is, um, tell me at least one, if not two or whatever, um, uh, lessons, like what, what did, like, after all of this, like, what is like that surprising lesson or whatever, what, what did you learn that you, you didn't realize you were going to learn it going in and by the time you're here, you're like, yeah, <laughs> I learned that. Yeah. Just learned that. Um, I, I would say, um, there's, there's, there's one major epiphany that I've been thinking a lot about recently. Um, I used to think that I was, uh, that I learned from looking around and looking at success stories and kind of templating myself, uh, uh, across like template myself around success stories. And so I would look at other CEOs that I thought were successful and I'd say like, okay, I gotta, I gotta be like that person. Um, and maybe some of that comes from being like a a daughter of immigrants. You know, I think my parents kind of moving here to this country, um, spent a lot of time thinking like, how do we make Christine as American as well as possible? Um, because maybe that'll help her be more successful. So, um, you know, there, I think there was sort of that kind of programming inside me. And, uh, you know, what I found was happening over time was like, I started to realize I wasn't similar to some of these success stories or these other CEOs. I was starting to feel um, a little bit like I was a bit of an imposter, you know, I was different, you know, I was obviously female, maybe, you know, um, uh, Asian background and, and you don't see that all, especially in the battery industry in particular. Um, I've had, I'd have had people in meetings say like, Hey, well, you know, since I've got a lot more gray hair than you, <laughs> like I know how things work and you don't, you know, and I've, I've I, you know, to this day, I've, I've had calls with customers and partners that have essentially, you know, implied that and, and it's, it was really frustrating. Um, but I think, I think more recently, I just kind of had this epiphany that, you know, why imprint is successful, why, you know, I've, I've been decently successful is that I'm different, you know, and, and imprint's different. And if I focus more on that differentiation, if I, you know, encourage my team to focus on that differentiation, we're going to be great. We're going to, we're going to be successful. That's actually what's sort of, um, at the fiber of like what's going to help imprint be successful rather than kind of copying everything else that's out there. I'm sure there's good lessons out there to learn, but um, when I started to realize I don't need to just kind of, um, you know, embody somebody different and, and, and instead kind of embrace the, the authentic version of myself and the authentic version of imprint, it sort of lifted a weight off my shoulders. And now I just kind of focus on like, okay, let's, let's focus on the differentiation. So that's, that's kind of epiphany that I've been kind of thinking about a lot. Um, and it's it's really unlocked, I think, new kind of power, new momentum um, in this company, especially as we're we're kind of in a, a scale up period and um, a really kind of like you know important commercialization sort of milestone for the company. Um, the other the other thing is that I when I first started the company, I don't think I really appreciated um, the time that you need to take thinking about the company culture. It seems a little bit sort of uh, trivial, especially when you're in a small company and you don't you just, you just expect things to sort of work. Smart people kind of make it work, you know, but in in reality, like, I think defining what are the principles of the company, what matters, you know, how do we operate um, is really, those are, those, that's a, that's like a guiding light for the company. It's incredibly important, especially as the company gets bigger and more complex, um, it becomes, it becomes even more important. So spending good time on that and revisiting that, querying that, you know, reminding people of that, you know, we now have company principles that we print on everyone's desk and one-on-ones with everyone. I ask them about, you know, how are, they, which principles they identify, which, which ones are they struggling with? It, it becomes really important to helping the company, um, you know, kind of align in the right direction. So I, I just underappreciated how important that is and how as a leader of the company, you need to spend time on that. Well, the, those are like two huge answers. And <laughs> I mean, e- each one of those, frankly, could go into like half an hour of conversation, yeah. you know, if you, if you really um, went there, um, you know, on the first one, the idea of being authentic and what I would call really owning it, you know, like mm-hmm. it, it's, it's like easy advice to give, but it's hard to do, you know? Yeah, it's like exactly. Y- you can tell it someone really like, you know, don't worry about being like other people, you know, like just basically really own who you are own, like yeah. how you're different, you know, mm-hmm. but like some, 
like sometimes, um, you, you know, people can hear it and it's, it's just not, doesn't really like do anything for them. And then yeah. something happens and, you know, it's like that epiphany or whatever it is. But once you can like really like, you know, own it or once you can like get in touch with that or once you like really believe it or I, I don't, that's what I'm trying to figure out is what, you know, what is the trigger that yeah. like makes you quote own it? Because mm-hmm. as soon as you do, you know, you've got this huge confidence that you didn't have an, until that yeah. moment, right? Uh, was yeah. there something like that, that where you're just like, yeah, screw it, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, anybody else, you know? <laughs> It's yeah. Like- yeah. I think, I think part of it was, um, for me, actually, uh, I, I actually, um, I became pregnant, uh, during a really tough time in the company. Um, we were raising funding. We were, we were kind of missing our milestones. We had a customer that was delaying things. And so we were not looking good, you know? Um, and I, and then all of a sudden I was pregnant too. And I was just like, Oh my goodness, you know, like I'm, I'm stuck in a really hard place. And I think, um, uh, you know, as, as scared as I was, that was really kind of a scary time for me and the company and as, as low confidence as I had, um, there was just sort of like this certain internal sort of engine that said like, well, I got to figure it out. You know, like, I, I got to push past this and I just can't waste my time on, you know, BS. And I, I really got to pull a lot of stuff off my plate and focus on, on these really important things. And part of what was like weighing my plate down was just my lack of confidence in myself and this sort of sense that like I wasn't I was worrying so much about being a good CEO rather than worrying about just doing the things that imprint needed to be successful sure, and so when I right. when I yeah and so when I, when I kind of removed that off my plate it just allowed me to laser focus on the most important things and so it kind of restored some power back um you know in, in my head which was really important and 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 like having the time to actually even step away from the company as a founder i think is really transformative you know when you're a founder you often think that every decision needs to go through you you know and you become a bottleneck to the company to some degree sure. and so having to step away and then for my, my maternity leave and then come back i, I kind of looked around and i was like everything's working better than than when <laughs> i was here i was sort of like you know kind of slowing things down and then i got this wonderful chance to come back and say like well okay I'm only going to focus on this one thing that I really, I'm really interested in. And I think that's going to be high leverage for the company. I don't have to do the 10 other things that I used to do, um, you know, before, before I, before my maternity leave. And so that was really powerful, you know, that kind of letting go and then coming back and realizing I can trust, you know, in this team. So, so yeah, those were, there was th- that in particular, that kind of life event, I think kind of made me a better leader and it made me appreciate, you know, um, that there are really good people in this company that uh, were also really integral in, in, in our success. And I could really trust. What, was there an experience somewhere in there that just made you really brave though? I mean, like, was there something where you're like, you know, we're going to do this and if it doesn't work out, I don't care, but it, it's just, yeah. it, you know, it's going to be, it's like up until that point, you're like worried, what will they say if it doesn't work out? And like, and then you cross this line where you're like, I don't really care. It like, this is what I think we have to do. And, and we're going to do it. And it's kind of like your principles become stronger than your care of, um, (laughs) and through this conversation, you're probably thinking like, Oh God, like, did anybody else ever go through this? But anyway, (laughs) like, yeah. Um, yeah. For me, for me, actually, um, one of those moments, there's a few, but one of those really big moments actually happened earlier this year. You know, Imprint is 10 years old, over 10 years old, it's almost 11 years old. Um, so early this year, we were 10 years old. You now, I was just kind of thinking, man, like we're 10 years old. You know, this has been a 10 year journey and we're still, um, you know, we're still scaling. We're still kind of, you know, um, designing in with customers. We really got to get to a big validation point, like for, for me, for the company, this is really important. And so um, I remember sitting down with a colleague and just saying like, you know, I, instead of, instead of just sort of being open and opportunistic and hoping that we're going to be successful, I'm just going to put a stake in the ground. And I ended up writing the shareholder letter and kind of co-writing this with this colleague. And I just wrote what I wanted to happen in the next two years. Um, and it just came from the heart, you know, it's just, it was just like, this is what's going to happen. This is why it, we've already, you know, done so many exciting things, but we're really primed for success. And I really want these things to happen. Here's a roadmap to that. And here are guiding principles to make that happen. And it just kind of flowed out, you know, I, and I, something about it kind of came out of just 
realizing like we really got to get this done you know we're kind of at this position 10 years later where we really got to get this done so so yeah i, I definitely have one of those moments earlier this year um and, it, and it's and that created so much energy and so much momentum and power for the company that's still a shareholder letter that um that you know we refer to when we recruit um new hires you know that we refer to when we bring on new partners or customers um and i've, I've made a commitment to to write one every six months essentially to kind of reinvigorate the plan so um you know it was kind of long overdue but yeah there was that kind of moment where a transformative moment where i thought like this has to happen and let's write down you know exactly what we want um for the company yeah, and, th and there's apparently like some sort of frustration that gets channeled into that intensity. Yeah. And so, yeah. you're like, you know what, it's like, uh, I'm going to just take that and like put it into yeah. something productive and, and exactly what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. kind of need that emotion, right? You, you can't really just do it by logic. Yeah, and it's it's a bit of a it's it's a focusing function too. I think a lot of startups early on, especially maybe technology companies, like technology platform companies like us, we kind of have a wide open filter for a long time. We're sort of trying to find product market fit with all different customers. And so we end up spreading ourselves thin across yeah. a lot of different sort of projects or whatnot. And so this earlier this year, um, it, like we just realized we couldn't do that. Like we couldn't spread ourselves across so many different properties because we were just only incrementally moving each of those, but not really getting to the finish line. So there was a bit of like, okay, let's say no to, you know, maybe eight of these projects and say yes to, you know, one key customer maybe, and then maybe a second one as well that's in a similar vein. And let's like, let's like really, I, I, I talked, uh, I don't play a lot of soccer, but for some reason I always talk about taking one shot on goal. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right yeah. term. And I, I yeah. use that with my team a lot. Like I, I only have one opportunity. What type of, what am I going to do? What's my strategy? What's the kick I'm going to use? Because I, I only have that one opportunity. And, and so when you start to constrain yourself, I think, and really focus, you end up, I think, really kind of um, qualifying the best possible decision for the company. And so that's that's kind of what happened earlier this year. We just decided we need to really kind of make a bet. We need to focus and let's just go for it. Yeah, exactly. Make, making the bet, right? It, it's like yeah. you're willing to make the bet instead of just yeah. play it safe on everything. So yeah. that's a great segue to this final question, which um, which is just to like bridge into Q and A, really. Um, mm -hmm. And that is okay. So now you're here. What's next? What's where's the industry? What happens now? Where's it going? Uh, you can yeah. you can shape that answer any way that you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so we um, make, I think, the, the leading sort of thin, flexible green battery. Um, and uh, it's been really rewarding to go from, you know, being in a lab at Berkeley, hand painting batteries one at a time to seeing industry screen printers, um, either roll to roll or sheet, like printing thousands, you know, of batteries at a time. And um, we're essentially designed into um, three different smart labels with different customers. Um, each of these labels are used to track and trace different things like food products, pharma products like vaccines, making sure they stay under temperature, making sure they get to the right location. Um, so we're on a scale up um, sort of focus at the moment. We're trying to go from making thousands of batteries to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands to millions of units um, and working with partners really heavily on that. It's been really challenging with COVID, um, you know, just in terms of being able to travel and work with partners um, and also supply chain issues. But we're right on that path. Scale is really the key. And that's, you know, that's going to unlock the future for imprint. So once we can make lots of batteries, I'm, we've really kind of proven that there's pent up demand to essentially be able to sell these batteries to a lot of customers. And so we're ready to kind of, um, you know, supply that demand. And, and is that basically the... Uh like smart supply chain story that you're building or? Yeah, exactly. Um, so for example, we have a customer that is literally shipping, uh, you know, vaccines um, from one, one sort of uh, distribution center to say like hospitals and, and um, injection clinics. And in, in that country, it's, it's a very hot, it's a, it's an Asia, a Southeast Asian country. So it's really hot, humid. Um, and if those vaccines get exposed to hot, high temperature for a long time, they won't be usable. But, you know, the scary thing is that, patients and and the uh, administrators of those drugs may not even know that um, so it's really guaranteeing the quality of that product it's also um, there's a lot of unfortunate you know nefarious activity like counterfeiting people 
taking um, some of these assets and replacing them with with you know stuff that's lower quality or whatnot and selling into the black market. So it's really also curbing um, you know some of the the kind of nefarious activity as well. So yeah, smart supply chain um, using um, essentially these sensors, these battery powered sensors to track and trace um, really valuable goods and making sure they're they're um, you know good quality all the way to when they're delivered. Okay, um, I wrote my question down, but I can't see it. Um, but basically, um, I'm studying making uh, semiconductor chips. Uh, and recently, the academia developed something that might enable machine learning to go into the um, Internet of Things mm -hmm. field. And I'm, because I, I'm an engineer, and I'm not really familiar with the field, and you guys seem to have a lot more experience um, in dealing with those people, knowing more applications. So do you know any benefits that might arise from having machine learning and Internet of Things? Um, yeah, so, I, okay, so I think it's a great question. I would, um, I, I, it'd be great to have Christine's perspective, but I, I can definitely give you my perspective. I think that's, there's a chance, by the way, that her phone is out of battery. So she's probably scrambling to figure it out. Right. So then you're just, all right. Anyway, I'll give you my own answer and then we'll see how many other questions really are from me versus Christine. Um, I, I think what's happening with, with IOT and machine learning is that the, the, the sensor market is slowly turning into the camera market. So um, there's, there's a terminology that I've started to hear a little bit more recently, which is software defined sensors. And so, um, you know, as the price of cameras drops, uh, it, you know, it used to be like just too expensive to be considered like a special purpose sensor. And now what's happening is, you know, first it gets into the volume of cell phones. So every, every cell phone has one and then it goes further and further. And then there's just so many cameras everywhere. So now what we're, you know, I think what the industry is trying to figure out is that endpoint, the camera takes a lot of um, data in because it's, it's a high resolution image, but what it needs to send back is not necessarily the whole picture. So if right at the endpoint you can detect something and that detecting can be um, a very localized machine learning type of process. So th there's a good chance that you're going to marry the um, the camera technology with this like um, maybe low power uh, enough performance and 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 maybe bridge it with this idea of you're doing learning everywhere and aggregating it back and sending it back down to the endpoints so that you know they can learn. I mean, whether it happens exactly that way or not, I'm, I'm not advocating you know that architecture or anything. Uh, in Data X, which is um, of course I'm very involved with, um, we're thinking of having a software-defined sensor track uh, next time. So some of the yeah, so you know some of the projects can be. Um, take camera images, but you're looking for something very particular and and only, you know, like converting. So in a way, it's kind of a compression. If you want to think about it, you, you take the whole image and you turn it into, yes, it's a motion detector. There's a person there or not, or, you know, or you saw this event there. A lot of that stuff can be for manufacturing um, things, you know, things like that. And like, I'll, I'll end this answer now, but it's basically, you know, that's where, um, networking and sensing, like, you know, bridge together because you usually have a lot of bandwidth at the edge of the network and you usually can't send everything, you know, you don't want to stream everything back to other places. Yeah. So either you have to move your computer all the way to the edge and that's called, you know, edge computing or, and, or you're converting um, to get lower, um, lower bandwidth, lower, lower amounts of information um, that you have to send back. Okay, thank you. That's very insightful. We'll see uh, when Christine gets back on. I really think it's a battery issue, which I think is totally ironic. Um, but um, 
I, in the meantime, I thought it would be interesting to share something from a leadership perspective. Christine talked about um, these principles that she's developed. Uh, over the last few years, the company, and she alluded to this, has had a, a bunch of different pivots um, or honing in on things. But one of the exercises that they did was this whole time spending um, spent on developing principles. And the three principles, one was trust, or one is trust. The other one are we are owners. Um, that everybody is responsible. And the third is a bias for action. Um, no analysis paralysis, a bias for action. So I thought that was kind of interesting to share as hmm. well. Um, you know, what What typically happens is that, um, and, and like this conversation will be just a lot more interesting with Christine in it, <laughs> you know, because these are, are her principles. But I think, you know, what happens is usually when, when you become founder of, of like a company or organization or whatever it is, originally the culture is really set by your own behavior. So the things that you do, they, they kind of like turn into the original like local culture. But something else that happens is that people who come in, you know, there's kind of like the founding team. And then there's people who come in later and the amount of ownership and dedication and so forth from the founding team versus the kind of like the next set of people, they're not the same. They're, they're not consistent. So where the founder is willing to do like just about anything to like make sure that everything is done right. The people who came in, you know, later in the company or in the organization, they're like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, it, it, there, there, there's not like, there's not quite the same. So my guess is that some of these things started off as, um, you know, like just how Christine likes to, to behave and what's worked for her in the past. And some of this, like maybe the we own and so forth might be a response to um, how it changed once other people like join the company and and trying to get that consistency of everyone being um, being an equal participant, that's <laughs> that, that makes a lot of sense. That, that, uh, I actually th there's a question that I think you can answer. Uh, Sarah, do you want to ask the question you had? Yeah. Keep in mind, keep in mind I'm not the speaker. I, <laughs> I'm just, um, I, I, so I have it's a, a happy thing me about uh, the 75 patents that you. Yeah. Like so I was wondering, um, so I'm taking a class with Bo Heidman right now about commercializing IP. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to figure out a competitive landscape, trying to figure out a good market for our different technologies. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe give two examples, maybe one of a pad that you were like, oh my God, this fits such a need and this is going to be a cakewalk. And another that you thought was going to be really, really innovative was going to, you know, change the world and just couldn't find a market. And, and and you want that from a lens of patents, basically, from from a lens of intellectual property, right? Okay. Um, all right. So first of all, let me qualify my experience with patents. Uh, most of the work, the intellectual property filings and things like that, I did was when I was working at first a company called US Robotics, and then it was acquired into 3Com Corporation. And I was at some point the head of what's effectively advanced development for like a large part of that company. So, you know, it started off with like me and then me and like three or four people. And then at some point it was like a larger group of people and, and so forth. And when you're filing a patent, um, in a company, it's a little bit different situation than when you're filing a patent as, like as an individual or like a really small company. Um, and, and I can explain kind of how both of these work. So when you're in a larger company, um, companies don't really, they're not worried about the one patent at the time. What they're worried about is um, their negotiations with other companies. So another company will come along and say, we have 500 patents in that area and you guys have two. So, you know, you're probably violating lots of our patents and um, maybe you should just pay us now before we get our lawyers involved in sorting it out. I, I mean, like literally the conversation sounds about like that. And, um, 
and, and I won't name names of companies, but there are companies that have a lot of IP and they just look for companies that don't have very much and they try to sell them a cross license agreement. And so they're like, you can either talk to us and buy it or you can just you know, pay for it, like, you know, after legal fees, right? So like, it, it's kind of like that world. And so when companies are uh, like growing and newer, they, they basically need to collect numbers of patents. It's not, it's not necessarily that like everyone has to be like the perfect market and things like that. So usually when you're working in, in that situation, um, you're doing advanced development and you see, like in our case, we thought um, we thought that people would use the internet one day for having video calls and having, you know, this sounds like prehistoric or something. But literally, before when we were working on that, this is not, was not happening. So you know, the like all these ideas that basically turned into Skype and turned into being able to do Zoom and all that. That was based on like technology that was going to be developed. But not only that, we had to envision what that world would look like. So we would basically brainstorm, well, if that's possible, then security is a problem uh, in that world. And if that's possible, then how do you find the other person to have that call with? So maybe there's a directory service and what it, so like you just think of like all of these different versions of the future and what will be needed and you start mapping those out and then you do i mean there's there's definitely like math and technology and whatever that, that goes into it but you you kind of have to build that landscape and then you can start writing the patents and if if they make sense right so it's not like there's a market need and you and, and you do that no it's like you see the world changing and then and it's all white space because it hasn't been filled out hasn't been drawn nobody knows what it's going to look like and in the larger company and then you can start staking it by saying when it happens that's what it's going to look like we did some calculations or we built a prototype or whatever and then then you filed patents on it when you're at a like a startup company, it's a little bit of a different situation. It's a little bit closer to what you're talking about. So in that case, like maybe Christine would have, um, you know, and obviously I know her story. So she would have worked on this battery technology and she wants to protect it. So um, now she did it originally while she's at Berkeley. So first she has to get that so she believes there's a market and so forth. And, you know, and then she files intellectual property um, that that's a whole complicated problem itself, because the, not only does she have to believe it, but the university also has to believe it. And so, you know, like there could be a thousand people here who all think something is valuable, but the university has like a budget of like so much across like all this, you know, things that they're going to patent. So they're like, well, maybe this one or maybe that one, but, and so they don't have another good way to sense it except when other people show interest. So if someone comes along and says, we'd like to invest $5 million in this technology, that's when they say, okay, well then we would like to file intellectual property. You know, so how you get the patent originally filed is by, by other people on the outside expressing interest to put money in things. This is like inside the university. Then as soon as you get outside the university, there's another dynamic that happens is that that one thing is owned by the university, but there's something which I call like picket fencing, which is then you file other IP around it so that, you know, whatever IP you have, the university may or may not defend it, but you still need all the like other related ones because you're turning into a bigger company now. And so you can't just like survive on one patent. So, you know, it's like, if that is new, you go through the same process I was describing before. All the things that are related to it, you have to build IP for it. I don't know if that's exactly the answer that you're looking for. I can tell you that is pretty much the way it works. Um, and hopefully it somehow pretty close to, you should basically tell this back to um, the, the um, professor of the class or whatever, and, and find out, find out what he says. Or it's she. recorded. I'll play it for him. So that okay. I, won't, I won't mess up any of um, your words. So that was a really great answer. I just wanted to ask, I wanted to just get some really quick clarification. Um, mm -hmm. 
when you talk about finding the white space, you're talking not just about the present white space, but the white space, what the white space is going to look like in five or 10 years as well, right? Um, yeah, so so definitely you're talking about white space and now and still, and you're right, you know, usually there's something that's changed in the world. And so, you know, that has enabled a whole bunch of other things. You know, it, it's like you would say, say up till this year, suppose we didn't have internet and then you see internet happening. So immediately you say, okay, well, if we're going to have internet, what else are we going to have? Okay. So then you're like, well, maybe we'll have online shopping. Well, if we're going to have online shopping, what else are, you know, like you can start to like imagine all the things that happen based on things that you see are starting to be possible now. So if some big change happened, you just basically say, well, what other changes does that imply? And that's, that's what I mean by filling out the white space. It's like a little bit like what's on the horizon, you know, based on this hypothetical, like change that, that is likely to grow. Thank you so much. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, people really appreciate that answer, Iklak. I think we have some other questions for you, but in the meantime, just to be cognizant of everybody, I, I just want everybody to know I'm pr pretty sure that Christine's battery went out in case anybody's worried because I've been trying to text her and I can't, she's not picking up the phone. So it is <laughs> the ultimate irony that her battery went out, but I'm going to go ahead and share the feedback and um, in the meantime, the, excuse me, the um, code, but in the meantime, also, um, I, I Iklak, if you're okay, I know people would love uh, to hear more uh, about your some of the answers uh, to certain questions. I mean, if if people want to stay and ask a question or two or whatever, I, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, yeah, all, all all versions work for me. Okay, Cameron had a question, and I I was trying to promote him to panelist, but I think for some reason he cannot get out of his current situation. Um, but Cameron's question is. It's coming on. Does one typically use provisional patents before marketing IP? Um, yeah, that's almost almost always the case. You you file a provisional patent so that you have basically one year to figure out whether you want to pay more money to to you know file more. Uh, it's it's very common. And then he has a follow up, Cameron. I'd love to have you on screen, but I don't think you're. Um, responding to the promotion to panelist, um, does filing patents show your hand to the competition? As Elon Musk has mentioned, and how do you determine when the difference is differentiated? Um, yeah, okay. So uh, does filing patents um, show your hand to the competition? Uh, it can. Uh, if, if you've got a long time horizon before whatever you're doing happens, then filing the patent, you know, if you don't think it's going to happen for five years or, or longer, once you start filing it, um, people can, you know, people can go research it. And, um, you know, I, I suppose you could probably go find out, you know, what patents Tesla is filing. Uh, it's still not like, it's still not super clear. A, a company that's large like Tesla, they can file a lot of stuff and not intend to do any of those things. You know, they they might file like a hundred patents, and you know, two of them they're really going to do something with, and the other ones are just kind of more like protective. Um, you, you know, kind of more like see how much IP we have, like negotiating power. So it's not like completely tipping your hand because because no one's got the time to go figure out which of all these ones they're, you know, they're really doing. So I think um, for Elon Musk, I don't, you know, I like, I, I don't know that that's a hundred percent straight answer. Um, it, it, it's a little bit, you know, tipping your hand. Um, I think that the bigger question is really just, do you need the protection? So um, if, if you're going to invest you know, a hundred million dollars in something and you decide that you're going to keep it secret so that, um, you know, you're not going to file any IP and you're just not going to let anybody know. I think you're much better off um, having the patent, even if people know you're doing it because you need to protect how much money you're putting into it. Um, if it's kind of like, 
you're writing some software and you're going to win because you're leading in the market. Um, uh, it's very hard to stop people from, from, you know, like people can copy your software in so many different ways. It's hard to really use the IP to, to stop them, the, the legal costs. Like there's versions where um, just being faster is more important. And there's versions where you spend a lot of money and you really have to protect it. And in those cases, the, the patent is, is, is the better answer. So in the, in the end, I guess the answer is it depends why you think you need to file the patent. There's usually a strategy with it. Uh, I will for um, thumbs up uh, on behalf of Cameron. So what I am going to do, just um, not to keep everybody on, um, Iqlaq, unless you have something in particular you'd like to say, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I will write everybody a note just to assure everybody when I hear from Christine that everything is okay. And I will take Sarah's question and Franklin's question and forward that to Christine and hopefully she can do uh, an answer. Um, that sounds great. I'm glad that we got through all of the questions we had for Christine, like in the interview part before it got cut. So um, I, it was it was really great to have her on, and and I I personally really enjoyed all of the dialogue that we we got to have with her. Thanks for um, inviting me to uh, to uh, yeah, it's chat with her. It's incredible to see what can happen when you reach out. I know there are so many students who are still on. 227. Um, but you really can reach out to professors and you can reach out to others on campus and see what a difference um, that relationship can make. And the fact that Christine was comfortable kind of going to complain to you uh, <laughs> and, and um, is also fantastic. Um, uh, Lars writes, these were some fantastic ex uh, answers. Thanks for stepping up to the plate. And I just have to reiterate, um, I will go ahead and share that code once again. Uh, with everybody. But in the meantime, um, Iklak, thank you so much for everything that you do. Uh, and uh, I loved Alex's, um, hopefully I can do this the right way. I loved what Alex said. Uh, I hope you all are seeing the code uh, about if it's entrepreneurial, your fingers in there somewhere. Uh, you <laughs> have done a lot. So um, Alex, thank yeah, you for- code, by the way, that, that was a great comment, but I, I, I think you have another screen up or something. Oh, I wonder what it is. Let me stop the share. Uh, it's always so interesting. I'm like, hmm, what on earth could I be sharing? Here we go. It's energy to Cal. There we go. Capital E and a capital C. And uh, thank you everybody. And it clocks, uh, currently at the Satarja Center over at the stadium in case you want to get a viewing. <laughs> all right. Thank all you right. all. And thank you for your time, Mick Alex, thank you for a phenomenal introduction. Pranati, thank you for your support. And Franklin and um, Sarah, we'll get back to you with your, your answers. And next week, we have um, even more people from the College of Engineering. Uh, Dean Sujay Liu will be with us and Mitchell Baker. And in case anybody hasn't heard of Mitchell and what she's done at Mozilla, um, she is a total badass and it'll be a phenomenal conversation. She um, took uh, open source and made it, commercialized it. I don't know how else to say it. Um, she is true blue Berkeley. She loves being at Berkeley. She, that is where she is at home. Uh, she is also a double Berkeley uh, major undergrad and also law school. So it'll be um, an equally good conversation. So thank you for your time this evening. Thanks, Iklak. Thank you, Christine, wherever you are. And I wish everybody a good night.